Hey everyone, welcome back to Conversations in Pop Culture, and we are back in the saddle once again for another season. And I would read you my sponsorship, but it might be a little weird because the guy who's my sponsor is actually my guest. Um, so I didn't want to go and do that. It'd be a little weird, but I have with me comic creator Paul Gomez. So welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You know, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Obviously, I'm a backer of your Kickstarter. Full disclosure, I'm very excited for it. I don't know. I might change my pledge and I might go higher or lower depending on one of the covers because I know it didn't come out yet. And I know you're going to drop it hopefully soon. But you are in the middle of your, I think it's your fourth or fifth Kickstarter, I want to say. Well, this is my fifth personal Kickstarter. I've actually been on six of them because I did attribute a one of my books to I, I guess a rookie outing that that had a collective of of new stuff and that was definitely a success so this is actually my fifth fifth one out yeah and it is prequel to aurora it's a very interesting book and we're gonna get into it um but before we do what is the basic premise for those who are just hearing about it don't know anything about it and curious and kind of the elevator pitch and I tell people it's gargoyles versus demons in an epic battle with a woman that's trapped in the middle. She kind of has a, a little amnesia at the beginning, but she's trying to figure out why she has this urge to kill herself. And she's putting those pieces together whenever she realizes that there are these gargoyles and demons. She's trying to figure out who's trying to kill her and who's trying to save her. And it's, like I said, an epic story of imaginary proportions that just gets thrown together yeah let's let's dive into this a little bit because <laughs> obviously we have a war waging on between two sides who clearly have issues with each other and kind of caught in the middle and i think this is sort of a microscope a little bit on it on the section of this war and the woman is sort of caught in it and she doesn't exactly know why she's there she doesn't remember who she is she doesn't remember what has happened how she got there. I don't know if she knows her name. Um, yeah. but Yeah, I, I think that's about all she knows. She knows her name. She knows that she's trying to, like I said, kill herself to protect something. And she's trying to figure out what. She doesn't know whether it's a family member. She doesn't know if she's trying to protect, you know, a state or even the world. And she doesn't e didn't even realize that there's gargoyles and demons or what's after her. So, like I said, it starts falling into place as, as things kind of go on from one page to another. This is more of an action-packed book where the action kind of pulls you towards the answers that, that you're seeking. And I really wanted to do that because of my artist who I, I wrote this for. Yeah, let's actually even dive further into that, too, because what's fascinating about this book is that obviously, you know, she's sort of getting caught in this war and figuring out why she's there and what she potentially did or didn't do or all that stuff. But what I like about it is that we obviously have gargoyles on one side and we have demons on the other. And they're both, I think, I think they're both relatively from hell from last time I checked. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly I sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a gargoyle expert. The last time I checked, I think gargoyles are on like, you know, the sides of buildings. Um, but, you know, you know, <laughs> beyond that, it, it's been a while since, since, since I've actually looked at what a gargoyle is. Um, so, but they're both, I guess, creatures and, 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 and of demonic ancestry is, is a nice way how to put it. Kind of, sort of. If, if you really look into gargoyles, they're, they're supposed to be protectors. And that's why they're really on the sides of buildings to kind of keep an eye on things and kind of protect the, the buildings or the people and whatnot. And, but we, we definitely wanted to explore those aspects. You know, are the demons the real enemies? Are the gargoyles the enemies? What's going to happen and, and what's going on? And like I said with her memory being gone, she's trying to figure it out and pieces just start dropping, you know, from one page to another, there starts coming a, a few people into it that kind of help her start putting these clues together. And it's like one action pack scene that leads to another. There's chase scenes, there's fight scenes. There's just an epic battle at the very end. Like I, I promise you it's, it's something that you've never seen from me or my books, but it's done in a way, and, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, 
I, I've always wanted to make sure that that it pulls the reader in where you felt something, and that's what this book does. Yeah, and the, 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 this is where it gets so interesting too, because from my understanding of this book is that this is before what I think a bigger war has occurred. And this is sort of obviously the title says prequel to Aurora. And this is, you know, every story has a beginning, middle, end. And this is kind of before all that. And this is sort of the prequel to something potentially bigger. I don't know if you have more in the works because I think there's going to be three <laughs> issues. But there's going to be three issues. Yes. In, in this one, there's going to be three issues in this right. series. I don't know if there's a bigger series coming uh, there more, more be. To, to be determined later, I guess. Right. Right. There, but, there definitely might be. I, I, I wrote when, like I was saying, I wrote this for my artist and it was, it was a, a, I loved his art so much and I wanted to just do something that was unique and, and could push his, his art to the limit. So I wanted to write like a trilogy, like my star Wars, you know, I've always heard writers say, you know, I have this, this epic opera battle kind of thing. And I, I never really had that in any of my stuff. Bushy Boo Circus Mysteries is kind of that way. Cause it is 12, 12 issues long, but that really was because whenever me and my kids were putting it together, we kind of talked about the chapters and we're like, Hey, this is what we want to throw in it. And that's the reason I say it's going to be 12 issues, but I never really wrote anything that was going to be my star Wars, if you will. And working with this artist, his, his art was so phenomenal. I mean, you've seen PTSD, his, his art was, was just so beautiful and different. And I was like, this gives me a, a definitely unique platform to do something that really was a, a prelude to something bigger so the, you mentioned something super interesting where and, and obviously i mean there's directors and screenwriters and somebody says i love this actor or this role is perfect yes. for this actor and they'll write a part for yes. that actor or they'll base an entire i guess movie around a particular actor you know, I think, you know, a silver lining playlist, I think it yes. is a good example of that where that definitely was based around Bradley Cooper and Jennifer yeah. Lawrence without a doubt. There's no way that could not have been written with those right. two in mind. And so what is that like? Because, you know, sometimes people write a script and they're like, cool, I'll find the artist later. And then the flip side to that is saying, look, I know I have the basic concept for the story, but I know I need this artist to work on it. And I know that this artist can do what needs to get done because I think it's a very different approach to yes. comedy when you say, look, this is the artist I want and this is the perfect person for it. And obviously I have a good friend and, and you know, him too, Travis Gibb and yeah. Granite State Punks is a very good example of that where I think, and Travis has sort of spoken about this, not directly, but he was sort of hinting at it. I think I could say it is his artist on that was the artist he wanted. And it was sort of written for that artist in certain ways. And that doesn't always happen. It doesn't mean your artist is bad in comics. It just right. means that sometimes you say, look, this person is perfect for this book in every aspect of their style and how they do stuff and even their vision for something or how they interpret something. So what is that like? Because that's a very different way to produce a comic, I feel. Yes, than it, in the traditional way. It really is a little bit different. Whenever I started out, which was not that long ago, about a year and a half ago, if that, you know, I was learning a lot of stuff from, from that first editor of mine, which was an Eisner award-winning editor. He told me how to look for an artist based on my stories. So whenever I got PTSD, we went through about 10 or 15 interior artists and we're looking at the, their samples and we had found San Espina. And his art was so beautiful, so dark and, and so gritty. But his u unique uh, play on his colors, I was like, that's perfect for PTSD. And having talked to him throughout the, the year or a little bit longer, it was like we would talk about pages. And he was like, I love how you wrote this, but can I draw it a little bit different? And we would kind of have a back and forth that was amazing. And then seeing his art, like I said, his his unique color palettes. Whenever I wrote Cryptic Haze, I, I knew that he was going to put a, a unique color to it. So I didn't have to write that color in. I was writing the, the frames and the paneling for him. But I knew he was going to do something special with the colors. 
So whenever we fast forward to Prelude to Aurora, it was like I knew what he could do and what he couldn't do. And there were certain stuff that, especially like like I said, the action stuff, he seemed to be able to push his art a little bit more. And so whenever I was writing the scripts, I wanted to do something different in like one or two of those action scenes that you don't see in most comics. And I knew he could do. As a matter of fact, he came to me whenever he saw the script and was on those pages and said, this is going to be challenging. And I said, I knew it would be, but I knew you could do it. And yeah, I don't know you, you if anyone else something. could. So, sorry to interrupt, but you mentioned something nope. where that there's a concept and I'm a car guy. And yeah. I understand that a Ferrari can do something and a Dodge Challenger Hellcat SRT can do something very different than a Ferrari can do. Right. And depending on what type of ride you want, depending on how fast you want to go, depending on how much of a room room you want to make. Right. One of those is more of a nicer ride. The other one's going to smoke the Ferrari. I'm not going to tell you which is going to do what. Kind of give it away, <laughs> though. But, you know, a Dodge Challenger Hellcat SRT is going to smoke a Ferrari. If you don't right. believe me, 819 horsepower on a souped up Dodge Challenger is going to smoke a Ferrari. It's going to be a bumpy ride, but it's going to smoke it. Um, but understanding, and the point I'm getting at is understanding what your tools can do. And an artist yeah. is a tool in telling a story, not to sound mean about it, or because I know I know it's going to be taken out of context what I just said, but understanding what your artist can do. Yes. And what they can't do is a real skill. And what is that like for you to even understand that, know that, or even ask saying, hey, I have this thing and this scene in here. Can you deliver on that or no? Because there are ways to get around that. But it's also important to say, hey, I know that my artist can take the car out into third or fourth gear every once in a while. So there's this one page specifically. It was a double page spread that's in this book. And I remember whenever I wrote it for him because I, I I I told myself whenever I was writing this, I don't want dialogue on it. I don't want dialogue because I want that action that he's gonna be able to put into it, that that the reader's gonna be pulled into that story with his pictures. So what I had to do and I had to make sure to do was make sure that I was telling him, This is what I want you to to, to show the people. This is how I want you to show it. And understanding that my dialogue's not going to be in there, his art is carrying the page. So I wanted to make sure to, to tell him that 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 his his art was front and center. And this is what I'm looking for to pull that character in and to get it from that that page before it to the next page after the, that double page spread. And whenever he showed me what he was going to do. I was like, I love it, but I need it changed in this specific way. He, this was the only page that he came to me with the second attempt, and he blew it out the water. I mean, every person that I showed said this was something spectacularly different than, the, you know, I've got it in my trailer. It, it, it's like everyone says how different it is and how amazing it is, and I told him, that first one you did was good, but the second one was exactly what I was writing for. And it, it's, I don't know if it was ambitious of me because again, I'm, I'm pretty new at writing, but I felt I could do some stuff with his art that I couldn't do with other people's art. No, it, it's interesting because obviously sometimes I think people just come across things. Also, I think that, Tom Hutchinson said it very well, where you should always be experimenting with Kickstarter. And it's the idea that if you don't experiment with anything in general as creatives, you know, you don't push the line, you don't get it done. So it might not even be just ambitious or you being ambitious. It just might be like saying, hey, look, let's try to do something here. Yeah. And let's see how we can push the line and sway the line and move the lines a little bit around. Because in order to grow, at least this is what I think, you have to take risks. Yes. And you also have to push your comfort zone. Yes. And, you know, it, it doesn't just apply in comics. And so, and also, you know, you're kind of like, this is your fifth, you know, Kickstarter that you're doing. You've yeah. been a part of another one outside of you personally running it. And it's kind of time to grow. Well, and, and the thing about that, I mean, you talking about being out of your comfort zone. If you read any of my books before, 
you know, PTSD. Bruce Never Bruce read Bruce one of them. Yeah. Just, just can't do, it, <laughs> do you see any supernatural anything in any of them? You really don't. And, you know, we'll keep a little bit, but, 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 but a little that, bit. The, that little bit is a magician. And so he has to have that magic, right? I mean, I mean, the start of Bushy Boo Circus has a little bit of that supernatural in there. Yeah, and, but beyond and, that, beyond that, it, there's not much it, outside of that. It's a little bit um, realistic in most of my books. PTSD, Cryptic Haze, it had had that little bit of spin to it, but it was kind of that uh, looking the se- wrong way kind of thing, misdirection. With this one, obviously, you know, you got gargoyles and demons, and this was my artist. You know, I was talking to him. I said, what do you like? What do you want out of a comic? And he was telling me what he he wanted to draw. So I took that idea and I spun it my way. You know, how can I get the reader to, to be pulled into this comic without the supernatural aspect, but throw it in? And so I wouldn't have never done this. I, I pushed the limits because I did want to do something for his art. I wanted him to love it as much as I did. In all honesty, I would have never wrote this script if it wasn't for him. And it is my best script ever. It really is. <laughs> so 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 let, let's let's even talk about that a little bit too sure. because comics is a unique animal. Yeah. Very very in way for for most I think creators, it is a team effort. Where unless you are a artist writer and you're doing the whole book yourself and you're inking it and you're doing it. And there are people who do that. And, 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 you know, it's a real skill. But for most people, you're either a writer, you're an artist, maybe you're a colorist and you're a whole, you know, team. And so what, what is that like, too? Because you write a script, but then somebody has to take your words, your dialogue, interpret them and then transform it into something very visual and then you get to go back or hand it to your letter or then takes your words that you put in as dialogue in there and then it creates a product. And so what is that like? Because in order for it to even get to that stage, the script has to be good enough and then it gets transformed. So what is that like? Because it's very much, you know, a team effort. In that yeah. regard, as far as the finished product is concerned. Oh, it definitely is a team effort. And I can't, you know, I can't thank my team enough. Writing a script or, or anything, you know, it, it's like having a child. It really is. I, You know, I have three kids and, and they're my world. After that comes my scripts because it's so close to me and so near and dear. You know, I tell people that this was my best script ever, and I really mean that because I've actually had people wanting to buy the script before any art got put to it. I had a few people that that test read for it and said, this is so amazing. I want to buy it just as is. And all honesty, I started negotiations with some of those people and said, if you get this artist aboard, I will sell you the script. But he has to be attached because I made it for him. <clears throat> Having well, said that, let's let's talk about that. It's already cut sure. you off because sure. this is interesting. Because as a writer, obviously I'm a writer. You know, you know, I'm doing stuff. You know, there's a fascinating idea of selling a script, right? And you can do work for hire. You right. could sell it. It's a paycheck, and then you can move forward onward with something else. And if somebody's willing to spend a good amount of money, it then becomes yeah. their problem to cover the right. art and some other stuff. And right. and you, you can go back to something else. Yeah. Yeah. And and so and so this this is one of the things about comics that's interesting is that and also, you know, if somebody's willing to pay you 10K for it, you know, now all of a sudden you don't have to worry maybe about funding the next issue of Bushy Boost so for for a right. while. Or yeah. you could lower your Kickstarter goal, or you can maybe produce three issues and then reimburse yourself on the Kickstarter on the back end. And now you, you have a thing where you could, you know, maybe take a month off if, if you so choose and chill out. Um, but what is that also like to let it go though? Cause that's the other thing too, is that whenever somebody, me and Tyrone from sober versus comics, we're talking about that. Whenever somebody makes me an offer to buy something off of me, clearly I say, cool, how much more could I get for it? 
<laughs> and, and sometimes, I mean, obviously I sell books on eBay and somebody is offering me $90 and the book is going for $110. My first reaction is saying, if they're willing to pay 90 off the bat, are they willing to pay 100 And sometimes I make a call and I say, look, you know what? It's a fair offer because I got this book for 10 bucks. So do I really want to be greedy or do I want to run away with the money and take my victory? But what is that like for you knowing that, hey, people want to buy this? Yeah. And um, what is that like? Because if somebody either has a really good vision with it or they know that they could take it to the next level or that they're a publisher and that they know that it's, I guess, fire for lack of a better word, but also if they're willing to give you money for it. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that, that it becomes saying, what do I have here? I guess is the question. And, so and you know, there's, there's a few answers I got to that. And, and I, you know, I see I, a lot. I of, threw a lot out. I threw a lot out for, for a reason. I, I, I see it, a lot of tricky, right. It, it's artists, a tricky issue, right? Yeah, no, well, I guess for some people it is. For me, it's kind of, I guess, easier to answer. But it, it really depends on the title, the conversation, and what's going to happen. So I've had offers for Bushi Boo Circus. I've had offers for Prelude to Aurora. Now. Right before I did Prelude, you know, I sat down with, with Mr. Ben Dunn uh, and Art Press. And, you know, I was telling him, I was like, I don't know if I want to do Bushibu 3 or if I want to do Prelude to Aurora. And, and I told him the concept and I told him what, what I had going. And he was like, that sounds amazing. You should, you should really consider doing Prelude to Aurora. And I said, you know, he's been in the business for years. So I, I didn't want to just throw that advice to the wayside <clears throat> whenever i had a uh, the offer for bushibu i thought it was a very fair offer and i, I almost accepted that it, it came down to one one small little inkling that that they said no to and i was like well if you're not gonna you know throw that in then i can't do it now bushibu is real close to me because that's the uh, the title me and my care my kids put together having said that I, I have like 15 ideas that I want to bring. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I could take that money, put it into another title. And these titles I feel passionate about. With Prelude to Aurora, whenever I tell people about gargoyles versus demons, their eyes always light up, especially the gargoyles part. And, you know, I, I'm not one to say, <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't think any of my books were going to sell. <laughs> now, I've been told never to say that, okay? I've been told never to say that that I, I thought they weren't going to sell. The it, fact it, it's, it's funny you bring that up because people tell me, oh, Andrew, you're never going to, you know, do this on your show. You're never going to make it here. And it's kind of funny because, you know, it, things have changed in society. Yeah. And yeah. also, you know, uh, it, it, it's weird. And what I find is that, you know, I mean, this is what I think. I think we have been in a society where people want to suppress. I really do. And I think it's been somewhat ingrained in, and I think it's actually been very anti-entrepreneurial in, in, in America for a very long time. And I think that's part of, you know, an issue. Um, <laughs> and it's the idea that when people say, Oh, I never thought, you know, that book was going to sell. I never thought somebody would say yes to being a guest on my show almost right. 10 years ago. And then I reach out to a celebrity like, yeah, when do you want to do it? You know, and it's a very weird concept. And I don't think people understand it unless you've been there. Yes. And so what is that like? Because I think it is interesting when, because I'm the same way where I'm like, man, I got to interview so-and-so voice actor yeah. or so-and-so wrestler. And they said, yes. And never ever thought they would say yes. And my attitude was like, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to ask, and I ask plenty of people, and I get 90% no's. But yeah. if you ask 10,000 people, though, you're going to get 1,000 yeses. Yeah. I, no, I only need one. I need one, guys. And you only need to sell one book, Paul. That's all you need to sell. <laughs> and and, and like, like I've told people, you know, I'm happy. I didn't come into this career looking for fame. I didn't come in looking for money. I came in to to show my kids, you know, 
let's raise the morale of the house while we were stuck in there. I, sh I wanted to show them, you know, positivity. And I think I've done that. Whenever I started, I started with Bushy Boo because that was me and my kids doing it. And there was a lot of bumps along the road that stalled it. So I doubled down with PTSD and I had so many people telling me, no, don't do it. You know, you're not a vet. This isn't a comic book kind of story. And then PTSD sold so much. You know, I, I don't really like talking numbers, but it so, sold a, a lot a lot that it kept me in it. And I was like, there was a point where I got let go from my job and I didn't know what I was going to do. My health turned bad and I was like, I can't go back to my job. But I was selling these books and it was helping me and my kids out. And I was like, why not do this? I, I didn't expect to ever do it. I'm. You know, I dropped out of high school. Uh, you know, I got my GD. I, I went to college. I couldn't handle the reading thing because of my dyslexia. I, I went to trade school because I, I don't don't let things stop me. But I never thought I would write a comic book. And then on top of that, to think that anyone would buy it. You know, especially after all the no's, it was like, it, it was a godsend. It really was. So, so, so let, let's actually touch on that because I am, I mean, this is going to sound messed up and, and you, you, you actually oddly might agree with me and it might get us both in trouble. I think <laughs> COVID was a good thing for me. I think it was a good thing for you. I'm not saying, no. it, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're going to preface this really hard <laughs> where if we had to redo everything. We would not want COVID, but COVID has changed the way I work at my nine yeah. to five. It has opened up a pathway where I get to work 80 to 60% alternating weeks at home. That's a big difference from going in every single day into my job. Um, it has changed also how things function. It has changed who I communicate with. You know, I am, I've been networking in the last four years almost virtually with everybody across the world. Yeah. And it is a very, very cool thing. And, you know, obviously my, my story, the, the basic is that I was doing pre-recorded this type of show and then COVID hit and then all these people were getting screwed and I just dived in and right. I have been live ever since. And it's been great because my numbers are better than ever and all sorts of fun stuff has happened. Um, but what and, and I also think that and going back to, to, I guess, where you're saying with all the no's is I think a lot more yeses have occurred because everybody was producing a comic, everybody was home. And I think that also people are like, I need content now. Yeah. And so what, what has that been like? Because I think there's been a shift in society that you came in at the right time. And I think a lot of people did where it's like, cool, the walls of Kickstarter came down. The concept of what people are looking for came down. Printing came down. And then it went back up and then it, it came back up. down again. <laughs> um, but that's not the point. That's not the point here. Um but I also think that it was timing in a lot of ways because COVID and, and I was speaking to a wrestler for LFC, Bella Rockefeller, and she said that during COVID people spent a lot of time with themselves and asked what do they want. And I think that's been a big shift that has happened in our society that has not ended the nose, but has provided alternatives to get around them. I, and, and I tell my kids this all the time. It, there's going to be barriers, barriers in your life. If you can figure out how to get past them or what to do whenever there's stuff that you don't know how to do, if you can learn to adapt, you're going to be better off. And, and that's really what happened, especially in that time frame. You know, I, I was stuck at home with my kids and I didn't want them on on video games and stuff. I never intended to make a comic book. Originally, me and them were just going to write a story that might be, a, you know, a story. Maybe we write a book and at one point we were like maybe a chapter book because of our dyslexia. We couldn't write that big. And even still, it was like, hey, you just introduced into us into comics. Why not a comic? So it was it wasn't exactly, you know, the, I've had some people say, well, you're living your dream. And I'm like, I never thought this would happen. No, no, <laughs> you know? the, the, the correct response is if I'm living my dream, where's my orange cone money? <laughs> right where where's the big money and i'm like 
you know, I got to admit this past year has been amazing. You know, I've met so many people. I got to meet you. I got to meet Pops. I, I met Mr. Ben Dunn. I mean, that's huge for me. You know, I, I met Rob Liefeld. I'm, I was like a foot away from Jim Lee. <laughs> that's that for, for a guy who couldn't afford, you know, comic books sometimes. I, I couldn't afford them every week. To, to have met all these people. I met The Undertaker. I met I met JJ from Good Times. I sat down with him for, for you know, 30 minutes or so. And I'm just a father with kids that was just trying to do something for them. So, I mean, for me to, to be where I'm at today, and I still don't think I'm, you know, I'm just making a book. I'm just making a comic book. I hope people enjoy it. I try to make the best book that I can. And that's really what it is. Yeah. And let, 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 let's even back out of the book a little bit and talk about a little bit inside baseball a little bit because yeah. obviously making comics is hard. Yeah. Selling comics is hard too. I'm just going to preface it that a anything regarding comics is difficult. Um, yes. Anything creating things in general is difficult. Um, but what has this been like? Because obviously Kickstarter is a interesting beast at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously we, we have friends who fund very easily. We have friends who should fund very easily. <laughs> we have friends who are dying out there hard. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and who, who, who have good products for, for lack yeah. of a better word. And it comes down to the wire and, Hopefully they're, they're going to make it. And even you're sort of stuck a little bit right now <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, where you're at, I think, 937 around that number. And you had a really good, you know, first week. And now you're in week two-ish. And it's kind of the dog days. Right. And Kickstarter has been weird. It's been weird since January. And a lot of stuff's going on with it. And I don't know the whole extent of what's happening internally, their algorithms. I don't know if it's a change of preference. I know that some people are killing it. Some people are not killing it. And there's been a weird shift reversal going on. And so what is your internal sentiment of that? Because I'm a consumer. And I can tell you from my perspective, there's been only one project that didn't make it, that I've been a part of. And I was bummed out about it. And I, it looked like a good project. Um, but I've also seen a lot of projects barely make it right. in, in the last six months. So I'm very curious as a creator and somebody more of an inside perspective where you feel it's going because it's confusing to me. Well, I think it's confusing to all of us. Now, you know, I'm, I've never been one to go into a Kickstarter expecting to get funded. You know, I, I've been blessed that you know, so far, every one of mine have funded. And I thank God, you know, I, I, I get a lot of people telling me, well, your next one's going to hit X amount, or it's going to hit the X amount. And, and I'm like, you know, as long as I get funded, I'm okay. I, again, I, I am a few dollars away from it. And God, I, I, I pray that I'm going to hit it. But, you know, it's one of those things that you never know what's going to happen, whether it, it's not getting out to people, whether you know, you're not getting seen or, or you're not building it correctly. You can guess, you, you know, you could take your entire day and worry about it, or you can work at trying to get seen. And that's the way I look at it. I don't, I'm not one of these people who, who watch the Kickstarter every minute. Like yesterday, I, I don't think I even looked at it, but instead what I was doing was, you know, building digital ads to to post it for like six hours i think i was making posts and i don't think i start worrying until week three <laughs> but but yeah i mean you see projects that fund and you're like surprised they do and then you see projects that are amazing and, and they barely get funded if they get funded sometimes and you're like i mean i mean i'll be very honest i had it to your ad by the way yeah. And, and I added a really good point. I said, if you're worried about getting your book, Paul's going to deliver you your book. 
and, and, and I appreciate it, yeah. In a very fast way. And I said, he's not paying me to say that. And <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was oh, funny. Right. But it, it's true. That, that, that's why I said it. Um, but it, it, a little bit of a joke. People think it's funny to some degree, but, but it's also very true. Right. And I've had this discussion with Chuck and I've had this discussion with a few other people. Um, sometimes I mention your name, sometimes I don't. But I say, look, you know, there's a real issue where I have people who owe me books. Right. And they're, 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 they're now late. I consider a year late. Yes. I, th- I think I think most people consider a year late. Pat Chan's Destiny New York is supposed to come in September. That book is not late. Because it's supposed to come in September. If it comes in August or it comes in October, it's not late. Right. You have a three-month gap from when you're going to say you're going to be delivering a book. There's another book that was supposed to be in my hands May of 2022. That book is late by a long shot. And we say that book is almost 12 months late. And so that's what I don't understand is that people are back in those projects that are late and consistently creators are late and not by a month or two months, but more like six, seven, eight months. And they come back and then somebody like you comes in and you're not really ever late or you're late by a few weeks. And I'm kind of saying to myself, like, what's Why? going on here? And I don't get it where you want content. It's a good book, you know, and, and I understand that, you know, if it's a big name and something happened or it's a cool title or they got like a model on a cover. I understand that argument saying I want that book, but I know a bunch of people want comics relatively soon and I don't get it. I think it's 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 the oddest thing that I don't understand is don't you want your books in your hand and don't you want to back affordable, fast projects that are decent. And now, and, and how do I put it? it, it now, my before, mind. before I go on a rant, <laughs> it blows my mind. I, I don't understand. Like, I, I physically do not understand this dilemma because I understand the problem. I don't understand the mentality and I don't know what I'm missing. I, I really don't know what I'm missing. And, and I don't, it's, think it's, it's a popularity contest. It really is. And, and, let me let, before I go into this, though, let me ask you a question. Has there ever been an artist that that went on a rant and told the truth, got blackballed, and actually kind of stayed in comics? Because I don't want to say anything that's going to give me trouble. There's been plenty of people. There's been plenty okay. of people. Okay, having I've said that, I, mean, I, mean, I do it all the time. I drop truth bombs all the time. And believe me, there's going to be a bunch of them coming if certain people push it far enough it's, with me. It's popularity. You know, I... I I'm in the industry now and and I hear other creators talking and, you know, I've heard a creator who's got a project and they don't even read comics. They don't even care for comics. And I'm like, how is it that you have one then? Stop talking about me. Keep your name out of my mouth, please. (laughs) Keep your name out of my mouth. And then, you know, I hear creators talk about how they're writing and how they're, they're creating their comics, but it's not. You know, panel by panel or numbers of panels or turning the pages and stuff. They're just writing paragraphs. And I'm like, does that translate well? You know, and then I look at their stuff and I'm like, it doesn't. <laughs> and I'm like, but they're getting, you know, eight, nine thousand dollars worth of backers, 50, 60 backers. And their stuff is decent to okay and i'm not saying my stuff's great i'm I mean, not <laughs> i've been a big big fan of this where i mean i had stokes on and stokes doesn't know what a page turn is and look i, I said it before i've said look you know what i don't think you need a page turn in a book i don't think you need one i think you could have one if you want it you don't need it you don't need it it's really up to you if yeah, you but want but it is it is the concept of comics, so it's got that page turn that that let, lets you have that pause. It's got that established. A lot. I, of I understand. Me- I understand. My, my my point is that I don't think you have to write a right. comic the same way that everybody else is. And you don't. And I I but, think there there are books that can do without it. I think there are books that need to have them. Um, and, I think, I think as long have- as you understand the concept, that's what what the thing is. As long as you know what the science is behind the comic because the comic is a different medium then my- I, I agree i agree my, my my point on it is that i think that if you say look i don't want to write a book with page turns and <laughs> you can make it work 
more power to you. I've read books without page turns. But I'm like, if that you're doing that, masterful. usually that you're masterful. doing it accidentally. I read this book, this comic book that was made by a TV director, or let's say a director. And to me, it was like the story was good, but the paneling and the pacing and, and the page turns made the comic bad. <laughs> And, and I'm not going to say the name because the name is huge. But I read about six of, of this person's books and I was like, he just doesn't know what a comic is. And I'm like, I, I, I love this, his stuff on, you know, TV film. But as far as his stuff in a comic book, it just didn't feel right. And I'm like, I can, you could tell, you know, if you can look at some of these comics and you could say, Hey, did you write this? How did you, how many panels did you want to put in this page? And they're like, Oh, I didn't put panels. I just let my artist deal with it. And I'm like, okay. And that's your choice. But again, whenever you get someone who studies this stuff to the detail, and I might not get funded. I'll, I'll be the God's honest truth. I might not get funded. But then you turn and look at someone to the left of you and they don't even read comics. They didn't even write their, their own stories. They didn't do anything on their comic. And I'm like, how did they get nine, ten thousand? 10,000? I mean, look, I might be in that... that position where actually that's not true i might write the story i just might not script it but that that's different too it, yeah it, it, that, that that's a different entity because yeah. you came up with the concept you just didn't script it that's completely different i should say but that, I, I i don't think we're talking about those because there's plenty of people who say look i got a great idea for a story i don't know how to script the book and i'll hire somebody to do that right. and those, those books sometimes tend to be really good because yeah. you're hiring a professional to take getting your someone mind. who knows what they're doing and that's that's okay too but because I, I might do, i might do that because honestly i mean i'm trying to script it but i might script it and i might go and hire somebody to re-script it and make it better and, and make I'm, it a, better. I'm a huge huge advocate for people to hire an editor i'm not an editor i would never edit my own books and the reason i say hire an editor is because there's a science behind that too. If you're not going to have an editor, you know, find someone to proofread it. Two, three people who are really yeah, serious. There's two two forms of editing, right? Well, there's there's, there's several. No, no, no. I think they fall into two camps. There's the actual technical element of editing, right? Which which you the should have somebody proofread it for grammar. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. It, 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 it is a given, and that's not going to run you much money. That's going to run you on a 30 page book, hopefully less than 300 bucks, give or take, if you're just looking at spelling and making sure your lettering is correct before you give it to your letter. Mm -hmm. And that editing is saying, hey, do we need a comma? Is the word discussed spelled correctly? Yeah. That's what that type of editing is. The other type of editing, which I think is actually more important, is does this story make sense or what yes. plot points are you going to spot out for me or what could we further massage or put another uh, coat of paint on? Do you, really need, is do you really need like eight pages of fight with no dialogue and they're doing the same things to each other? It's like he punches him, he kicks him next page. He punches him, he kicks him. Why, why are you using all those pages? And there might be a reason. There yeah, might if be a there reason. might be a reason, but that's what your editor does. They come and talk to you with PTSD. You know, I've got a few pages that are full pages, right? My editor came to me and said, "Are you being lazy? Is is there a reason that that these are full pages?" And I said, "Yeah, these are impact pages. These are are hit you in the face, bring them back to those specific moments." And that's what I was doing. And he's like, "Oh, okay." I was like, you know, my first script was 32 pages and each page had an average of about eight panels. Now, I didn't know what I was doing back then, but 
32 pages with eight panels per page is not being lazy. If I needed to fill a 22 page book, not, not hard at all. <laughs> if I had like five or six panels per page, that's not hard. You know, it, there's a reason that I do stuff. Like I said, here's that, that double page spread in this new book and there's no dialogue. But the reason I did that was because I want that reader that to feel that impact of that action and, and to make you understand this is what you're going to be diving into in the rest of this book. So it's like, if you understand how many panels you need per page or what you're doing with it, that that's a deeper, uh, I think a, a deeper feel for the reader. And I think a lot of these creators don't really do any of that. And it's their choice, but uh, you know, so let, let's are... even dive further into that too, because they, they, this is where we get controversial, and this is sure. where 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 uh, I'm part of the problem, and I got no problem admitting it. Um, <laughs> I'm a big variant guy. There, there's yeah. no question about that. I buy and sell books, and I and I sell books for a good chunk of money. Right. I buy you know things that are on Kickstarter that are off Kickstarter. I buy variants that you know obviously are sold directly to consumers. Shop variants. Um, no, we are not going to talk about Frankie's comics. It's a sore point for me. Um, <laughs> they owe me money, and I'm not happy about it. They screwed me on Ivan Tao and Nathan Sarzarizi, I think is his name. I'm really upset about it. Three great covers. Really, really, really just sad. Um, and they screwed a lot of artists. Right. Not good either. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I think a lot of people also now are come to the conclusion, I don't even need to write a good book. I can easily right. write an average book, have Coast killed on my name. On it. And, and look, I'm guilty of this. Or the cover. Full, full, full disclosure. I'm getting an exclusive trading card that I'm the only one who has it in the world in 25 of them from Greg Bo Watson. Yeah. You know, you know, coming in June, July that I'm going to sell. I'm guilty of this. There's no question about it. It's an awesome piece of art. It's Rogue from the X-Men topless. It's going to be great, guys. I'm telling you. 40, 45 bucks a card. And, and, and I'm going to be selling them all day. And I'm about to love it because she's right now really hot, both physically and like the hottest female character in comics. But not right. the point. Not the point here. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I mean, variants sell. And you they do a shitty book. Yeah. And you sell a boatload of comics because people say, I really don't know what the book is about, but I like, I this. like the cover. And this is how I know this. Xenoscope used to do live streams. And it used to do trivia of the Xenoscope history. You know who knows Xenoscope history and trivia? I do because I read Xenoscope. <laughs> Half your audience doesn't even know some of the story stuff. And they didn't read Robin Hood that Chuck Dixon wrote or Howard Mackey wrote. And you know, I'm like, I know the answer. Can I answer, guys? Like, can I answer this? And they're like, you won like two prizes already, Andrew. I'm like, I know, but can I answer? And it's just like, because I, re I read it and I used to review all this stuff. So there you go. So that, that's my whole thing is that, but people want the variants. So I think that's part of the problem. That's what I see. And, and, you, think. you know, you, you hear this a lot. You hear people say, you know, they're, people are buying it because of the cover and not what's inside. And then, the way I see it is, well, then that's a shame because they're going to be missing out on a lot, of, a lot of great stuff. You know, if this campaign funds, that's great. If it doesn't fund, hey, then it's great. Then maybe me being in the comic industry isn't for me. <laughs> I hope to be. I want to be. You know, I, I feel like I, I can weather the storm if I needed to. But do I really want to compete with someone who's just tossing words in? And selling a beautiful cover. I don't know if I want to be in that industry. I plan on staying. You know. I, I'm trying to. Get known with. Publishers and you know. People know my. But it is hard to, to figure out. What people want. Because sometimes. Yeah, I can't imagine them not wanting. Any of the concepts that I'm bringing. Gargoyles versus demons. Uh, a circus mystery, Scooby-Doo meets Criminal Minds, 
you know, PTSD was, was my biggest seller. And I was honestly a little shocked, but. You know, so let, I, let, I, let me ask this. Let me ask this because I had a Timothy B. Fling on last night, yeah. and he brought up a good point. And one of the things is that that I think people in comics sometimes forget is that, and, and obviously I'm getting into the retail side of things. Right. And you know, I think a lot of creators don't know how to ask. Hey, what do you want as a retailer? And well, that, that and, and I think it goes further into that, saying, Hey, look, what do you want as a fan? What makes you stop in my campaign and say, cool, in which if you, if you put 100 campaigns, what makes me click on yours versus somebody else's? And, you know, that's something that I think, you know, I think people who run campaigns, you need to have focus groups and not, no. not for your concepts, but even how to build your campaigns. No, and I agree. I agree on that. Having said that, you know, whenever I go to LCSs, usually I ask them. What is it that, that you want? What, what is it that I can get, build, bring to your store that you'll put on your shelf? I had a live launch with this one. And I had a live launch that was in an LCS. And they loved, loved this book. They wanted to sponsor me. They, they pledged a good amount. They, they're talking about a store exclusive. You know, they're, they're really excited. As well as some other LCSs. <clears throat> What could I have done in this campaign that was, you know, uh, just to the campaign? I, I know I could have done figures and I could have done other stuff. It would have probably put me in more debt because my other campaigns that did do that didn't really go that far. You know, I did have foil cards and I'm going to do some cool scratch goals when I get to it. <laughs> I'm going to say when, but. You know, I, I ask people what they want in a comic and, you know, most of them want colored comics. They want a good concept. They want a good story that pulls them out of their day. And that's what I felt like I've given them. I got an award for PTSD. I've had people come up and say that, you know, some of these books are the best books ever. And I'm not, you know, I'm not paying them much. <laughs> I had a, a person review my comic who was a big influence on me and usually does just Marvel and DC and, or the big name reviews kind of stuff. And they called my book phenomenal. They featured it on their show three times, but I still didn't reach that much in my, my campaigns. So it's like, I don't know it, what people tricky. want. I, I hate yeah. to say this, but, but oh, yeah. show, and I'm very honest. I'll yeah. tell you what moves the needle. It, it voice actors move the needle. And, popularity and, and, yeah and i hate to say it but yeah. when somebody is the voice of amy rose from sonic the hedgehog right or neji from naruto or rock lee you know and i have a three minute clip of saying hey how'd you get the role rock lee you know somebody wants that answer or for instance there's a short clip of you know megan holland's head which is coming out in probably like two months from now of her just doing her character from bleach and it's 25 seconds but guess what right not, I don't think it's popularity. I just think it brings back memories for people and it's funny and people, you know, kind of catch into it or she's doing the voice of nurse joy and people want to hear that or they want to hear about how she got, you know, the role of nurse joy. And it's nothing against even popularity. It, I think it's just the idea that people have fond memories of their childhood and that's what moves the needle and indie comics is hard. And it really is really, really, really hard to move the needle. And I hate to say this, but like, this is what, what I mean, you know, last night after me, me and Timothy we were, were speaking about this, he's like, what do you want? And I mean, right right now, I, I don't really need much because I think it's going to take care of itself. And it's also only a $100 retailer package. But right. if I needed something more that it was on his campaign, I mean, his retail package is pretty good and, and I can make some good money on it. Um, the, the risk, at, the reward outweighs the risk. Right. But I think that's one of the biggest problems is that what made you stop? What as a retailer do you want? You know, what as, you know, picking me picking up a retail package, it's like, I need meat on the bone, but I need more than just your books. And yeah. especially when I'm an eBay store, you know, it's kind of, you know, if I'm on whatnot, right? And maybe I will be, if I pick up 50 of your books, maybe you should come join me on whatnot. And we could obviously both go, you know, digital and you yeah. can help me sell your book. Or maybe, you know what it is? If you have a show and I'm buying your book, 
I could come on. I could be like, oh, yeah, I got a few of these things. I got some practice deals. And, you know, guess what? This is what I think a lot of people in comics have failed is that, you know, you need to really understand, you know, what do people want? And I don't even think colored comics or things like that. But, like, I want a cover that depicts X. I want a cover that does Y. I want a glossier cover. I want thicker card. I want, you know, bonus material in your book. And I think this has been the biggest problem is that if you don't know what somebody wants, you should ask. And well, I think in comics, people have forgotten that rule. I really well, do. I, I don't think there's really a clear, concise answer because I'm, I'm telling you, I've definitely asked that. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's hard to say, you know, what people are, are wanting. I, I, I've heard a lot of people say, hey, I want original pages. I put tears with original pages and they never sold. You know, uh, I've put retail packages, and I think I've only had one sell. And, you know, it, it's one of those things that that it's hard to, to gauge. So let me ask you a question about retail. Sure. Have you actually asked retailers what they want in their packages? Well, I'm, I'm in 28 of the 30 retail stores around DFW. That's be, not – not because I called them or emailed them. That's because I went physically face to face, even before I had books, took ash cans to them, promotional material. Ooh, ooh, and the main yes. thing, yeah, the, the main thing was I wanted to talk to them. I wanted to know what they wanted, what their customers wanted. And, you know, what was it that, that would attract a new independent person to them? So, so I mean, yeah. I, I definitely did ask them. Let me ask again, you further. Let me ask the question further. Did they back on Kickstarter or was it outside of Kickstarter? It was outside of Kickstarter. You get where I'm going with this, well, right? And, but they always told me, and this is what the answer was about 90% of the time. We feel that Kickstarter pulls from our business, our company, our, our, our profit. So it was like whenever I went back to them and, you know, talked to them, we'd make deals and arrangements that you can't do on Kickstarter. So, it's hard to make a retail tier on Kickstarter if you can't make certain deals. Yeah. See, 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 this is the whole issue is that it's hard for me to pick up a exclusive, excuse me, exclusive on Kickstarter from somebody because there's certain things I want that I'm not going to be able to negotiate and negotiating. Right. right. And saying, I want a store exclusive from you, per se, and your book. Doing that on Kickstarter is hard. Yeah. I would much rather do it outside of Kickstarter, get right. some Kickstarter benefits, and do certain things that the site prohibits. And that's the whole problem yeah. with it. And sometimes it works. It, it, if I'm just wanting 50 books from you, it yeah. might. it's easy enough to do it on Kickstarter. And if you say, Andrew, I have four series and – We'll mix and match what you want. That's easily doable on Kickstarter. Yeah. Easily oh, doable. Yeah. But for me to build my own exclusive on Kickstarter, it's it's impossible. Right. It, it, it's impossible. It doesn't work. And it's way too expensive to do it. Yeah. Versus saying outside and negotiating it outside, saying, look, I want A, B, C, and D. And I want the ability to do A, B, C, and D with it. Right. And there you go. And it's, it, it's a problem. So, I mean, that's that's really the reason that that retail <clears throat> tiers are hard on Kickstarter. I think I got one up right now and it's uh, 15 books for like 15. Uh, you know, I can't remember off the bat, but, you know, it, I try to put a good deal up there. Whenever you're talking to people in the stores, you, you can work other arrangements out. Like I said, there's stuff that you can't do on Kickstarter that you can do in person. Let, let, let's be realistic. I'll tell you what you can't do on Kickstarter. You can't do a deal saying, look, I'll give you a reduced rate, but why don't you, you know, you know, we, we could do 50, 50, if you lay out some money up front, you know, 20, 30 or 20 consignments, consignments, now, sign books, CGC exactly. options. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, some, some other stuff, maybe, you know, if you're 10 minutes away from a store, the idea of reordering at a certain rate and locking in rates. I mean, there's 50 different ways you can do things. Because yeah. be really honest, if I had a store and PTSD was selling out every three months and 
I might want an arrangement saying, look, I'll order 30, but then if I sell out, I want to lock it in at a certain price point. And so, I've had that. And you can't do that on Kickstarter. You because can't do that on Kickstarter. It, it, yeah. it, the platform's not set up for it. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've had a buyback option with one, one uh, LCS. I'll, I'll leave these here at a certain amount, and if they don't sell, I'll buy them back at that amount. But it's one of those things you can't do with Kickstarter. I've never really had to buy any books back, thank God. But but it's like to have that option, to, to have a consignment kind of deal, to, to have a – tell a, a store, hey, if you pick up 50 books next week after you pick them up or two weeks, I'll come sign so the customers ain't buying them from me. They're buying them from you, and then they're going to meet me to sign them. Which a lot, uh, you know, one or two stores were like, that sounds awesome. You can't really do that on Kickstarter. It, 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 it's it's an issue, and oh yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Oh, and, yeah. and, and look, and look, I'll be very honest. I mean, what I want when I pick up an exclusive is I want you know support. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, if if I pick something up, you know, you know, I'll use Travis because I don't think he's gonna mind. If I picked up an exclusive from Travis. I'm not expecting Travis to come up to Connecticut, but I'm expecting that maybe, you know, we could do a whole show of talking about the cover, talking about Travis, talking about the book, and we can direct traffic to it and we could do it either on his thing. It could be a shared thing or, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, across a month, maybe we could do two shows, space them out. And then maybe every once in a while he could, you know, throw it back up on his show. Say, hey, you know, Andrew still has some of my covers and yes. so forth. But that's hard to do on Kickstarter to set up. It is hard to do on Kickstarter, but it, it's it's happened with me. I had a, a gentleman who was on Whatnot. He bought an ad in my book, and he's like, hey, if I buy an ad, because he messaged me, if I buy an ad on your book, I want to sell it on Whatnot, would you mind coming to the Whatnot show when I sell it the first time? I appeared on his show like three or four times. I had a great time hanging out with him and talking to him. You know, he sold all the books, and then Keem bought an ad on the next one. And it's one of those things. It's harder to do on Kickstarter. It's easier to do whenever you got that conversation flow going. I, I try to bet, support all my backers. So it's like, why am I not getting funded? I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I don't worry about it as much as other creators do. I really don't. I, I just want good comics. I want good comics. and I, I do too. But, I mean, it, it seems like the world is okay with, Decent, mediocre ones. <laughs> I'm not like like I said. I know my stuff isn't the best out there, but there's some stuff that gets funded really well, and it's not. I mean, I mean, <laughs> look, I'm guilty of it too. I'm guilty of it too. You and I, me I, both. You I, and me I both. An awesome cover. It had Chloe James on it. But you know, it's Chloe James. Chloe James is smoking hot. I don't know anything about the book. I think it's only 25 of those covers, and I'm like. It's Chloe James. And so, that was the end of that discussion. It, they, like, there's no rationale. I don't care about the book. It's just an awesome photo of her on a book. And there's 20 I saw And I don't I care. Saw <laughs> you know, I saw him. I, I wanted to back I saw him because I, I wanted, you know, everyone was talking about it. And I wanted to back it because of that. That's but July the, Eric, right? Yeah. The, thing, the reason <laughs> that I did a, not. Joke. That's such a bad joke. I'm so the, sorry. The reason I did not back it is because. I, I I didn't really feel or believe that his story was going to be the one. It wasn't going to be, you know, I mean, it's his first story. Was it really going to be that good? So, so I didn't back it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and let, let me explain. I, I, I have two positions on this. No. Um, I thought it was average. Honestly, I, I, I it. thought it was. I didn't think it was – I think the hype was overhyped. It was. I think there was a lot of pressure. I think it was this anti-woke book of trying to stick it to, you know, woke and the norm in comics. I think but, it was overhyped, overpopulated. I think got that back. What, 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 what he did is he capitalized on a – Popularity. Popularity. He, <laughs> he, he capitalized on a circumstance. Well, in America, he he took advantage of a narrative, and, and, and a lot it. of people do. But and there's again, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the overhype on that book, I looked at it 
And I was like, this thing is going to be average. It's not the next thing. It's over positioned. Everybody thinks that this is the way the future is going to be. Everybody says, oh, this is challenging crowdfunding. And my response to that, is it replicatable? And I looked at it and I said, no, this is, this is, this is an odd one out. It's an average book. It's no different than, you know, a Marvel DC, maybe the top five Marvel books, the top five DC books. This is in that league. It's nothing special. It's nothing new. It's not a new mold. Is it cool to see somebody break the system? Sure, but it's not replicatable. Same thing with Brandon Sanderson with his writing and the books he did like 50 million on Kickstarter. Again, I, I made this argument and, and it didn't get far with, with certain people. I said, is it replicatable? Because if it's not replicatable, it is not the norm. And, and, and that's the whole thing. If somebody does $10 million on Kickstarter and nobody else does it, that's the odd man out. And so that, that's how I view Eric July. Good on him. I'm yeah. Oh, yeah. Way to go, man. But Put it, I mean, if you're doing your an average yeah. project, you know, I don't even know if there was an editor on there. I don't remember seeing that. And I looked. I, didn't, I, I mean, I know there was posters. I know there was the book. I know there was some other stuff. But I was just like, really? Like, th th this didn't do it for me. And I'm a ClickFunnels guy. That's all it was. This thing has been around forever and is one of the most heavily advertised software mechanisms ever is ClickFunnels. And he legitly just took a ClickFunnels thing. And I was speaking about it years before and nobody listened. And then Eric July does it. I'm like, told you guys. It, 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 and I still don't get credit for calling it. I still don't get credit for calling it. I've legitly shown the ClickFunnels books on my show and yeah. nobody gave me credit for it. And I knew exactly what he was doing. And it's extremely replicatable. All you need to do is just build up a talk host show. Yeah. And, and, I, and the person who should replicate it is EVS. That's, that's the guy who should be replicating it. And I don't know where, where, where you stand with EVS, but, you know, I'm impartial. But he's the one who should replicate what Eric July did. Yeah, I don't know where I stand with them either. I really hadn't. I mean, I, I've heard he takes so long with his book. I had a friend who just received one, and he was like, I waited a year or something for this, and it was damaged and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't know. Was, Look, it, was it good? To me, I, I asked my friend, I was like, was the story good? <laughs> I was like, that's what I'm concerned about. Was the story? Because I know EVS is an artist, right? I don't know if he's a writer because I haven't ever read anything he's done. I, I liked his work in 12 Rules of Life. I thought he did a good job on that. <laughs> no, no, he worked on that with Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. He did the art yeah. on, on a bunch of that stuff. He did that. the art. But, I mean, is is are you buying it just for the art? No, I bought it because Jordan Peterson is really smart. <laughs> He's really smart. Well, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, I put so much into every aspect. Every but but, but then again, but then again, I did buy the flash because of EVS. And, and, and it doesn't bother me that, you know, that people buy whatever they want because that's what they should do. What bothers me is that other creators aren't putting, you know, all that into it. That's what bothers me. I, I, I think I think it goes back to gamification, right? I'll, I'll be very honest. I'm working on a story. It's a fun story. I don't want to dive into it too much, but I'm planning to have an action figure variant on the first issue right. of the main character because I think it's fun. It is a yeah. gameplay. It is yeah. smart. I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be enjoyable. And But I understand that it's gamification. I'm going to write the best story, get the best art I can afford, all that fun stuff. But I also understand that if I get a Keith Garvey or I get, you know, a Greg Bo Watson and then I get Blair Shedd or Adam Riches or there's a few others who do really good action figure artwork, guess what? That can make or break me. And oh, it's yeah. gamification. And I understand it's a <clears throat> I like action figures and I'm trying to hit that niche of the yeah. action figure collector because it's, it's a segment of the population. And it's a game because what if they bring me two grand that I didn't have before? And they never open it. Who cares? Because I got the book funded. Right. And that's what I think is going on. Partially in comics. But 
again, again, this is controversial. I got no problem being controversial on the, on these topics, but I don't think people necessarily disagree. I speak, I think people don't want to talk about it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that people don't want to talk. There's a lot of stuff that people tell you not to talk about. You know, I don't and listen. Then, I don't listen. <laughs> well, I mean, I got two contracts that say, hey, there's some things that I can't talk about. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't really want to talk Paul, that much. Paul, Paul, Paul. We know you can't talk about Coca Cola. We got it. Right. <laughs> we, we, we understand it's in the contract. We, we, we've got through it. <laughs> But I mean, it's it's one of those things. I, I I'm not usually a controversial kind of guy anyway. I, I'm just here, like I said, I'm a, a father of three kids that just wanted to write. You know, I, I didn't well, think anyone was. Gonna I don't write. even think I'm that controversial. I think I'm just <laughs> stating what everybody knows is that it, it, it's just nobody says it anymore, and yeah. it, it, it's not controversial. Anything that I said on the show is not that controversial. I, I mean, I mean, the most controversial thing that I've said on this show is Jordan B. Peterson. That's legitimately the most <laughs> controversial thing I've said on the show in EBS. And even that's not that controversial. But I digress. I digress. Yeah, I don't know you about know, that one. <laughs> Your plays are going to go down now, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they do, they do. I'm like, hey. If you want to go anything. buy it back an average book, then that's your choice. But, I mean, there's some great books out there, and a lot of people put time and effort into them. And if you're doing that, then I applaud you. You know, I, I've always said, if there's anybody doing more work in this industry than me, let me know because I want to do what they're doing. You know, I, I, mean, I don't want to be I can, name, I can name people. I can name people. That do more work than me? I don't know. J.D. Calderon puts a lot of work in. He is, a, I'm not saying he isn't a beast, but you know, I was talking to him, I think a week or two ago, and <laughs> I don't know if I upset him or not, but I was like, you know, I did a lot of studying and questioning of, of, of uh, customers before I did any of my books. PTSD would have came out black and white if I hadn't have done this. You know, if I hadn't asked all these customers, hey, what do you want out of a comic? And I said, I felt like about 90% of people don't want black and white. And I I hope I didn't offend him because I know his is black and white. <laughs> so he, he actually spoke about that. He was just on and what, what not 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 you, but he, he was talking about why. What he said is that right. I try to keep the price down and black and white is cheaper. And it that is. doesn't mean that I can't go back and recolor it and reproduce right. it later, remaster it. But if it's black and white and then it's out there. That's fine. And then, you know, I get it out there. I put it into a trade. Then I get the money there. And then I get to do the whole thing. And then he's going to hopefully be done with, you know, Oswald Chronicles. Oswald and then who's to say that he can't redo volume one in yeah. color? And that's his choice. It's it's really, like I said, his choice. Uh, you know, I whenever I was making comics or started making them, whenever I decided that it was actually something I was going to do, because, again, it was an accident. It was something just for me and the kids. And. I was like, if I'm going to do this for customers, I want to take their input and know what what they're expecting. You know, and if 90 percent of the people that I asked said, hey, I won't even buy something, you know, that's not colored, then the product that I should put out is colored stuff. <clears throat> variant covers. I was big on not doing variant covers originally i wasn't going to do a one but again i went and did surveys you know the customers wanted variant covers so you know i've done them because i felt like that that's what the customers wanted and and i'm not doing like you know i've said this and i think a few people have taken it the wrong way i'm not doing this just for me i know people are, are that have passion projects and they're like when we were talking earlier about if I could sell them, I could sell any of my books. They're all for sale. Anyone wants them, let's talk. Because I have like 50 other ideas that I would love to get to. Do I do I love my projects? Do I take care of them? It, it, do it's I interesting. Me, me and uh, Tyrone or Tyre, a tear from, from Sovers, were talking about the idea of selling a project and selling an item. 
Same thing with Royal House. And I think this is one of the biggest things. And I've heard it on both sides. And one of the things is, and I'm not going to say who who was very oppositional to it, um, but my thoughts on it are that, look, if somebody's willing to buy an IP off of me, there's depending what the IP is, depending on what they're offering, depending on what contract they, they're giving. Right. I mean, I'll be very honest. If somebody wanted to buy conversations in pop culture, I mean, it's a discussion. If somebody's going to write me a check for a million, I mean, it's it's a consideration. I, without a doubt, all of the IPs, all of the shows, concepts, all of the logos, it's a real consideration because, and let's say I couldn't compete for two years. Guess what? I'm on vacation for two years. I'll do something else. I'll, I'll have a show about money. I'll have a PTSD. show about speculation. And that's the whole thing that, and I'm very curious not to cut you off, but okay. what is that like? Because let's be realistic. I mean, you, you're a writer, so you can always create something. And yeah. if you now never have, or let's say that somebody was willing to buy PTSD for 50000 right? right? I mean, that's not going to yeah. change your life in, in, in the way that you're never, ever going to not have to work again. But it's going to give you a lot of money to fund your next two or three ideas minimally for at least two or three issues. I'm going to feed my kids, which is what I said whenever I started this, that I was trying to do. It wasn't, it wasn't just me. Do I love comics? Yes. Do I love my projects? Yes. And if you haven't ever talk, heard me talk about PTSD, you know, this is a passion project that I put everything into. It was my first book and, and there's nothing that's ever going to be my first book again. Would I be willing to sell it? Yeah. Because to me, it's about me and my kids and I have, 10 other projects waiting to be done you know i i would love to finish bushy boo to that 12 issue i would love to finish cryptic haze to that th third issue i would love to finish Pro prelude to aurora and again i i got you know dracula's descent that that we're working on i've i i got a modern day zorro that i got put up i've got flame that i got put up i've got and these are some stuff that I, I think people really could connect to. I'm not going to say that one of them specifically is the greatest thing in the world, but I, I love all of these projects. Each it, it, gets, one. it gets interesting because you get called a sellout. And what, what I get called with that is that I'll be very honest. I don't think you're selling out. If, if you sell your IP or sell a piece of your IP, I think quite honestly, what it is is that you're saying I'm making an economic decision, right? And that I'm taking the money and running, and that you oh. know, <laughs> what's the point of creating something and running a business if it doesn't produce you a distribution and a healthy distribution, or if it doesn't produce you an exit? And I think that's something, and I'm not saying you have to take the exit, but if you're producing a book and it's producing you five grand in profit every year, maybe and somebody offers you 50,000, well. You know, over 10 years, you're going to make that 50000 or you could sell it now and have 50000 and there's advantages to both. And, you know, and there's other ways how to set up that deal, too, meaning that it's you could set it up as a reverse royalty, taking less money, but you get 4% of all net sales. You could, you, there's a million ways how to set something up. Right. And so that's something that I think is fascinating. I mean, there's always, I'm not at that stage, but if some show came to me and said, Andrew, we like all your wrestling interviews. Can we license them off of you? And they wanted to put them on their YouTube channel because they want the views and they want the micro content. And they want to enter a three-year deal and they want all my content, but then it would come off of Facebook, come off of YouTube or be privatized. Then I might take that deal if they were writing me a check every year for like two grand for on a three-year term. I mean, you know, and would I lose some content for a while? Sure. But you know, or if they wanted to buy certain interviews, I might sell it depending on what it is, because guess what? It keeps me alive. It keeps me funded. Yeah. And I you hate know, to say if this is a business. Yeah, it, it is. And, and that it's kind of the way I see it. It's like, how am I going to get to my next comic? You know, if I could sell one comic and, and get another one made, I probably would do that. You know, whenever I was talking about selling Bushy Boo Circus Mysteries, 
it came down to a small detail in all honesty and it wasn't really money so it came down to a small detail and it was like the the main reason i would do it was because i would have stayed attached to that project my name would have stayed on it i could have finished writing it out they would have basically produced it and then i could have went and spent all that money on finishing prelude to aurora right out you know one two and three right back to back to back instead of having to wait to see if it's going to get funded to see if i'm going to afford that next issue so it's like yeah you're you're selling something but you're gaining something else do i have other projects i want to get to heck yeah if i could be writing seven eight books right now and producing those seven eight books at the same time i i guarantee you i would do it like i said i've got uh, modern day Zorro. I've got Flame. I've got. Uh, if I looked in my my folder right now, I, I I would name them all off. Some of them don't even have titles, you know. And like I said, it's 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 one of those things that I don't just have one. And I feel like everyone can connect with with them in different ways. PTSD isn't the same as cryptic haze. Cryptic Haze isn't the same as Bushy Boo Circus. I, I guarantee you that none of them are the same as Prelude to Aurora. But people are going to connect with all of them in different ways. And that's what I need to do if I'm going to consider myself a writer. Yeah. Make, you know, make sure I connect with people. It, it, it's very complicated because the business in of itself is tricky it is hard to find projects and yeah. i think people really struggle to to fund projects that's why people are relying on kickstarter and i don't think i think kickstarter and the marketing play is great but i also think it's really really nice when you have a war chest to function oh, yeah. and, and 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 i don't think it's selling out if i created four comics and i sold one of them to somebody who wanted it and, you know, let's say Titan Comics want it. We're going to pick on Titan today. Um, yeah. And they're going to write me a check for 20 grand. And then that allowed me to take care of the other three and own the other three outright. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer because now I solved the problem. And that's the issue. Or I have seed money to build a company that actually has funds. And if you manage your money correctly, you don't need to take outside money ever again. And you can use Kickstarter in a unique way that takes all pressure where you could lower your goal to like 500 bucks right. or hundred dollars. Right. And now you are basically saying, if you want it right now, you can get it. Otherwise you can see me at a comp and you can pay double what you're going to pay on a Kickstarter. And so I, I, I just think that it's very tricky. And I think that a lot of people in comics take things a little too personal and they take things a little bit saying, Oh, I would never do that. I would never sell my baby. And I'm like, but you're not, you're, you're selling part of your baby, but you're also getting a lot of other stuff and you're stabilizing a business. And but, you know, maybe, also, yeah. Also, I, I do think, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, I think that some people only have one or two ideas in them, you know, and, and, and I, I think some people get those one ideas and they, they're stuck on it. And they don't expand because they're they're kind of just there. So yeah, sometimes I, it's, it's good to to get outside of that box. I, I don't know. I think I think people have one hit wonders. Yeah. And, and, well, and look, I mean, honestly, sometimes they're not even hits. That is true. That is true. That is very true. That and is they're very stuck. True. They're stuck on that one thing because they think you know it's going to hit next time. It's going to hit next time. And, and also, I think sometimes people have a successful campaign where they're doing 20, 25,000, but they're not able to break 30. Yeah. And so, and so you, you have a situation where you're not able to get to the next level, but you have a good level you're at. Yeah. And that, that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother thing where <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it where people cannot break $30,000. They're doing great, and if you're doing twenty five thousand, that's wonderful, right? That's great. I mean, if you were doing twenty five thousand, you wouldn't be complaining. But you, you, you get where I'm going. Where if you right. did ten campaigns and you couldn't break thirty, you would say, "What the hell am I doing wrong?" 
right? I mean, at, at a certain point, you're like, I got the twenty eight thousand, I got the twenty nine, but I can't. Break. I haven't, I haven't broke two thousand, so <laughs> you, you, you get where I'm going. Yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> Even to use you, if you did eighteen hundred and you did eighteen hundred again and again, and then four kickstarts later, you're not breaking two thousand. You're gonna start saying, "Look, I'm happy that I'm doing this because it's good for where I'm at." But why am I not getting past the 2000 benchmark? And those are fair questions, right? I mean, when you get to that level, I mean, you know, I ran a campaign. The question for me is that, you know, if I run one and I set my goal for a hundred, my goal is to get past the thousand dollar benchmark on my first campaign. And then let's say I do 2000. The next one I come out, I want to get to 2500 or I want to get past the 2000 benchmark. And then I want to grow it slowly. And it's very important, I think. But again, we'll cross that bridge when I get there. Right. Right. But yeah, you got you got a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, obviously, you got a bunch of rewards, which we should talk about. <laughs> got cover A. I think this is cover A, I think. Is this yes. one? Yes, yes. I got it right. I got it right. So that's cover A. Man, this bean is an amazing cover. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it's, it's nice. I mean, I like cover B a little bit more, to be quite yeah. honest. Cover B is my style, but it's good, too. <laughs> I'm not anti this one. I just like cover B more. I, I love it. And, and yeah, definitely. Jeff Hughes cover, it's, it's stunning. Dave cover B is a colors. little more subtle. It's a little more yeah. subtle. It's yeah. kind of like taking the Lambo out. You know, the uh, Dark Knight, uh, the second one, he, he it's like a... I think we need something a little more subtle, Alfred. And he takes the Lambo out. <laughs> it, it's it's like the it's a great scene, and that that's how I view this cover yeah. is a, it's a little more subtle. But that, that that's course, that's just how I view it. But those are the first two covers. We get a you know the third cover coming from Zach Spivey, and it's going to be a five gay full cover. We're definitely waiting and and hoping and praying it's coming this week. But it, it's going to be amazing because his art is just off the chain it really and, is. And, and i know i know there's some some interesting stuff going on with that i am i made this suggestion for for paul that he should eventually do all five of those in a metal cover um, <laughs> and, and, and paul paul was not a fan of that suggestion yeah um, he was he was not a fan of that suggestion very expensive very expensive <laughs> i don't know how you'd put them together either you know Stay no, no, you have to do so. five individuals, and then it becomes a connecting yeah. set. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, we we go bigger, we go home. It's, it's yeah, home. right. <laughs> I, I think five gay full cover is going to be big enough for me. The metal part, we'll leave that for. Right. I then also get... said that that he should do in a sequel a spot foil, a whole hollow foil, and then <laughs> he and then then he should do all five of them individual that connect later on. Paul was not a fan of my idea, but, 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 but I like the idea because it's not my money. So <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, if I hit 40,000 on this campaign, we'll, we'll definitely do it. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 you'll just send me the, the one of ones. Oh, the one of ones. Okay. <laughs> that, that's how this is going to play out. <laughs> but, but all jokes aside, obviously a five gate fold is fun. Yeah. Xenoscope did that. Um, there's a few other companies that, that have done those as well. Um, and so what is that like? Because they're fun when you have yeah. gate folds out yeah. there. and You have essentially five different covers on one book. That's kind of the – well, it's going to be one one cover because I, I wanted it to be, you know, a complete – picture it, it, it's 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 a the reason why i say it's almost like five different covers is that there's creases and each crease yes is it could technically be its own cover but it all connects technically yeah i guess it could technically be its own cover i don't think it would be have as impact as it it, it would you know i i understand like the the x-men cover that was for you could definitely separate it because it really was laid out that way where you could separate it uh, Mine, which, which one are you talking about uh, x-men one jim lee's the, the jim lee did something and then campbell did something too where he did a three connect thing yeah. yeah which is super cool super cool really expensive books now but anyway yeah. continue uh, but yeah i i think it's it i wanted a a, a full picture uh, you could definitely disconnect them and you know we definitely planned it out where the creases were going to be. 
but it's more you know i i really wanted something that was big and spectacular and like i said featuring zach spivey's art did you, you know, also feel that it's different because not many people do a five gate full cover and the idea is that you need new rewards, you need new concepts, you need new ideas into it and you also need to say cool I haven't seen this in indie comics all that often let's see what this does and let's kind of take a peek at this because let's be realistic you have to attract my attention. And on top of that, it's like, you know, at, at table signings or at conventions, I'm going to have this five gate full cover that I can unwrap and just sit right there. So while people are walking by, they're going to see that and they're not going to see that at anybody else's table. So it's going to be an eye catcher, not not just on the Kickstarter, but at, at conventions, at, at signings and stuff like that. And right now I'm toying with the idea of limiting it to 50 because, uh, you know, the campaign's not exactly doing well. So I, I might limit it to 50, but I was really hoping to limit it to, to 100. Tell you the truth. Yeah, that, 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 that's a you decision because yeah. that, that, that's tricky. That's tricky to figure it out. I mean, look, I, I play in exclusivity. I mean, obviously, I said earlier in this show that I'm having a limited 25 trading card combo. You know, I like the fact that there's only 25 of them in it and there's value there and i know i know there's value and it also allows me to set a higher price right or or it allows me to keep it at a certain price but maintain value right and, and so if i have 25 limited 25 cards and i'm selling them for 40 bucks a pop and somebody says i feel like it's valued at 60 they feel like they got instant value right. automatically off of a greg Bo watson exclusive trading card and I think I'm going to do it right with it, or I could set it to 50 or whatever price I think it's worth. And who knows what it's going to be worth? And we're going to find out. We're going to find out. It's going to be awesome. But I, uh, 50, 100, yeah. you it's your call. I don't yeah, think I mean, it really depends on, like I said, how the campaign's going probably in week two or three. That, that's when I'll probably put a number on it. Of course, I got to have it to show it off first. That's definitely the first step. <laughs> And then after that, you know, I, I really don't, I, I don't know if it, it sounds bad, but I don't know if I want it to sell out that fast. Because like I said, it being on my table is definitely going to be an eye catcher. Yeah, that, let's actually talk about that. that. That's an interesting concept too, is that yeah. I have merch in my eBay store. Yeah. And I don't want that merch to leave so quickly. <laughs> right. And, and it sounds weird. But I'm more than happy to have certain merch sitting in my eBay store exactly. for a year or two. Yeah. And it's cool. It looks good. It's fun. It's expensive. And I'm happy when it sells. And I would like it to sell first and foremost as I want to have listed it. But I have some rare books in my collection that are up on eBay that are trading for like two, three, four hundred dollars $400. And I'm like, if they sell great because it's a lot of money. But at the same time, I'm also saying... You know, it, it brings some eyes. Maybe somebody's looking at it. There yeah. you go. And yeah. it's tricky because sometimes, you know, eyes on the table might be worth more than yeah. eyes not on the table or it being sold completely. And I don't know what you're going to sell for. I think, what is it, 25? 25 on the Kickstarter, yeah. So if all of them sell on the Kickstarter, <laughs> I mean, that's great because you're going to get yeah, funded relatively quickly. Yeah, you don't have that eyesore catcher. Account. Yeah, and then if that's the case, I mean, you know, there's other shadiness, <laughs> shadiness, other things that might come up later. I don't I'm know. You saying... take it black and white, hollow foil. You could do the metal. You could do color. You could do color. <laughs> you <could> do spot foil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you also could do a collection. This is the third uh third book that me and San Espino worked on. You you I mean if it sells out really quickly once it's dropped, I mean you could technically break it up into five, you know, separate comics and then, you know, if people want that and you sell it as a five pack. Yeah. Because no, I mean, you never know. that's not that hard to do because it's creased out and if somebody wants it and all of a sudden, you know, you could have a whole 50 set of that. 
<laughs> You'd be surprised. Zenoscope. No, no, I and believe it. Out like crazy, dude. Like what they do is that they do it piece by piece by piece every other month. And yeah. so if they release it in February, the next one comes out in May and the next one comes out in July or June. And then all of a sudden what starts happening is that um, when you get to the last month in like November or December, they release the gatefold. Yeah. And so now you get all five covers, but you had all five and they all connect. Oh, it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. And then and, 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 and you do it the exact opposite way. Right. Oh, I got so many ideas for you. <laughs> well, there's so many. I'm telling you, there's so many routes that I might go after the case. I'm going to make you Zenoscope 2.5. <laughs> this Merck magazine is 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have legitimately <laughs> taken their model. They, they have I'll taken their model without a doubt. Um, but I digress. I'm going to get me and everybody else in trouble. Um, <laughs> I know way too many people who work there. That's the problem. And I know way too many people are going to be working there too. Um, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Um, <laughs> so many people I could get into the unemployment line. So it's so, <laughs> <laughs> so many secrets. This, this is why, you know, you know I, I stopped drinking on air guys. Um, <laughs> too, too many ships were sunk. Um, <laughs> good thing I wasn't around during World War II. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a terrible joke, terrible, terrible joke. Um, but there's also a sketch by Jeff, Jeff Muth. There's Jeff spoil Muth. covers, there's the retail tier, there's the metal, metal cover, I think. Yeah. Um, and then the full ad, I think, unless that's it's gone, sold yeah, it's sold out. I think the original cover, the meet and greet. And yeah, there's some awesome. other stuff too. There's some other stuff out there. And yeah, I, think, I think that that's all of it, right? Yeah, and we're getting ready for the stretch goals because, like I said, we're we're hopefully going to get funded soon. And once those funds go up, we're going to start putting up the stretch goals. I think I'm going to do a stretch goal at every 200 for that first thousand, and then the second thousand probably at every 300. But right now, the the first one is going to be a, a digital books three more digital books so even if you pledged on the digital tier you're going to get a little extra and then after that we're going to do some mini prints and a sticker which is you know always good to do yeah 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 i'm, I'm not i'm not good at stretch goals oh my god i i i gotta figure that out but i i have ideas i have ideas we all know we all know what i want we all know what i want i love metal cards they're the best. Oh, I love metal cards. They're expensive. They're not that expensive. Just stop it. Just stop. They're expensive. They are not expensive. Mm -hmm. You're so full of it on that. <laughs> I mean, if you put it in a tier, that's one thing. But if you're putting it on a stretch goal, they're expensive. Not the way. Not the way I told you how to do it. So it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just, I told them how to do it affordable and cheaply, and he doesn't listen because mm -hmm. that means I'm not getting my metal card. So I'm upset. Well, maybe this you'll get metal me. cards. Not about you. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I ain't getting metal cards of Prelude to Aurora. I'm just saying they're not going to be on that first stretch goal set. They should have just been included right from the start. Because, again, it's your <laughs> <in> mind. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have no problem telling you to put metal cards in when it's yeah. your money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're beautiful. And like I said, I definitely want to get some. But, yeah, not yet. Well, I told you how to do it, and, and, and I'm disappointed. I, I'm sorry. Our friendship's over. Um, <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> well, most people would think it would be over something a lot more substantial. <laughs> Not. No, it's over. It's, it's, it's all metal, metal cards. cards, guys. I draw the line at metal cards. You know what I'm <laughs> campaign. We're done. It's like, it's like divorce proceedings all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I get the comic, though, right? I get, I get oh. to keep the comic. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, I mean, I mean what, 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 what type of sick human being do you think I am? <laughs> like you have a metal card? I mean, that would be terrible for society. <laughs> do you really think that society wants you to have a metal card? No. Nope. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying here that I know how to negotiate for what is necessary and we all need I'm I'm an advocate for the people, Paul. Yeah, I might need I might need a an extra cover that might 
pop up on the Kickstarter soon. I I, I can draw with a crayon. Oh no, I I, might <laughs> have... I just started drawing. Did I tell you about that? I sold one of my sketch cards. I was kind of shocked. But no, there might be a, a another cover that's not on the Kickstarter just yet that might be popping up there soon. I, I'm an excellent crayon drawer. <laughs> I put Harold to shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he 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 went into retirement with his purple crown. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was it was it was a marvelous day. It was glorious, if I must say so myself. <laughs> and this purple crayon just went to bed. It was over. It was <laughs> over. There wasn't even a competition. It was one and done, guys. That's hey, how if I, 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 if I drew stick figures. Maybe I'd get more more backers. <laughs> I only draw stick figures, and I have many backers. You might, you might you're probably do a lot better than me. <laughs> <laughs> stick figure fight it's the book yeah <laughs> it's it's every panel's a stick figure doing something <laughs> i guarantee you the book would do amazing the book would do amazing i have this thing planned out oh, oh i'm not even i'll tell you off air it's so good it's so good the concept um oh but, but, but i digress i digress i'm gonna get you and me both canceled you and me both <laughs> so quickly so quickly and then we're gonna get recanceled. That's how bad it's gonna be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Pepsi will drop us, but Coca Cola will pick us up. Yeah, um, they'll pick us up. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> but I digress. You got a lot of stuff coming. Obviously, you're about seventy bucks away from getting funded. Um, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Um, if you want a good book, a book that's going to be entertaining and a decent book and something that, you know, is well thought out and well positioned and is good and more importantly, though, will be delivered to you safely and on time. You know, Paul's book is for you. Yeah. And also, I think with shipping, it's like 18 bucks for covers A and B, which isn't that bad, all things considering. It's pretty affordable. Um, you know, I've seen campaigns where cover A is like 20, 25 bucks. And we, and then that's not including shipping. So I've seen things that are $15 with shipping. So, you know, obviously you're kind of right in that sweet spot where it's affordable. Yeah. And, you know, and then your cover C is $25, but that's more premium. So that's the whole thing right there. Um, and that, that's all I'm going to say is that if you want a good book and you want affordable and you want it fast and delivered safely to you, your book is perfect for that. Um, and again, it's 18 bucks. Don't have a Frappuccino for two days. Yeah. Drink water instead. <laughs> you got to have something to read while you're drinking too. So, I mean, why not? Yeah, no, no, that, that's called tea. Um, <laughs> this is also good for you. Um, it's, it's better than coffee, guys. It's better than coffee, but... I do digress. I do want to give you a chance to self-promote yourself. Um, obviously, we covered a lot of stuff, we covered a lot of controversial stuff. <laughs> and, uh, hopefully, you're not going to get canceled. I'm pretty much canceled proof. And uh, after everything that's happened to me, I'm still here. So <laughs> obviously, though, I do want to give you a chance to promote yourself. Where can people find you, bother you, follow you on social media, back your Kickstarter, and potentially hit you up if they're interested in buying anything including your comics that are for sale as ideas. Like I tell everybody at the end of my show, which is Wednesdays on the Madness at uh, Reality Co Pub Publishing Comics. If you need any help, if you want to contact me, if you need just ask a question about comics or, you know, deep, dark place in your life and you need a person to just talk to, Paul Gomez 790. I'll be glad to help you learn. If, you, if I don't know the, the answer, I'll find out. Paul Gomez 790 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Again, PTSD, my first book out, Bushy Boo Circus Mysteries, issue one and two are out, Cryptic Haze, and this, this amazingly fabulous book on Kickstarter at the moment. That's Prelude to Aurora. That's where I'm at. And then I'm just going to say it, and I'm going to keep saying it. Um, you need to support Indy. 
And what that means is you need to back Kickstarters when they are active. And I don't recommend Kickstarters all that often to back. Um, I have actually backed this Kickstarter. So I am a backer. Paul will confirm that, even though you're technically not supposed to do that. But I figured out how to do stuff, <laughs> which is okay. Um, and I am excited for it. I backed Cover B. And so I'm very excited for it. And obviously, as I stated before, um, if you like what you heard, you like demons versus gargoyles or gargoyles versus demons, and you like, you know, some weird wars going on and some other cool stuff happening, uh, this is a book for you, as well as if you want your book to actually arrive to you pretty quickly and safely and get a good book. You know, Paul's been doing that for f at least four other campaigns and this is his fifth one, so I have no doubt he will deliver this one also in that fashion. Um, furthermore, if this is not your cup of tea, because not every story resonates with everybody, um, you can still follow people on social media and check out and share what they're doing and engage with them, because that helps too. And if you do like something that a creator does, you, know, you should go buy it, even if it's not on Kickstarter, if it's in their store. And Paul does a lot of store exclusives. So I'm sure that if you're looking for some of those, he will be happy to direct you to where you can buy them. Um, and so that's everything I think regarding you. As far as I'm concerned, obviously I am Pop Anime Comics on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I appreciate people interacting with me on social media. Uh, feel free to subscribe to any of those things. Hit me up, bother me. I'm more than happy if somebody shoots me a message. I typically do respond. Um, I just ask that you say, hey, how's your day going? Or be kind, because that's usually how it works. And if you have any questions about podcasting, comic book investing, things of that nature, more than happy to help. Also, my ad rates, if you want to advertise on the show, are actually up in the description up above. And you can shoot me a message on that site that I have listed. Um, it is a little long, but we can work out a deal, as always. Also, I have Buy Me a Coffee, if you want to support independent media. And that's everything that I got going on. So on that note, I'm going to give you the final word. Thank you all for reading, coming, enjoying this segment. Please support Indie Comics. If it's not me, support one that you love. But definitely go check out Prelude to Aurora. And I don't think I could have said that any better myself, everybody. And that is a wrap.